Thanks very much. The brief was talk a bit about the Northern Ireland Protocol, but also look ahead to the political year. Uh, so it'll be a sort of mix for the next 15 minutes, sort of half and half, looking at the protocol, uh, but but also making a few probably rash forecasts. And in terms of forecasting, I'll I'll, um, I'll just share my screen um, because what I want to do is, I hope you can all see that, yeah? Uh, really want to look at the year ahead, but also I've got to try and maintain a, a reputation that I got last year. I managed by complete fluke to get the, the Boris Johnson um, confidence vote in the House of Commons correct, sort of one out on the numbers, but the percentages. I said that, that only 59% of Conservative MPs would back Boris Johnson. I said that 41% would vote against him. And I said that that wasn't going to be enough. It was a worse result than Theresa May um, and that he would be out by the autumn. Anyway, lo and behold, The Guardian picked up on this. Um, and um, uh, rashly labelled me Mystic Meg. Uh, and there on, they wanted a whole series of predictions uh, after, after that, which I had to make for various things, including predict the next Conservative leader. And I did say Liz Truss, although I didn't predict that she'd only be there for 40 odd days, uh, I, I must admit. Uh, so it was fine saying that Boris Johnson will be gone by the autumn was fine while it was in the Guardian, but then the Daily Mail ran with this mail online professor dubbed mystic meg of politics blah 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 claims boris will be out within six months and it's fair to say that whilst the guardian readership was not unhappy with those uh predictions the mail online it's fair to say that their readership uh, was warmed less to this uh there's some of the stuff that i got from the mail online he looks and sounds like a remainer labor voter plus he's a so-called academic ignore him uh he told the Guardian, wonder is but wonder where his political affiliation lies. A typical academic woke expert. Uh, an academic from the politics section of the University of Liverpool, obviously a hard left trot with an agenda. Probably thinks Stalin was a jolly nice fellow. Uh, and then uh, my favourite, I think, was will he resign his position if Boris stays till the next election? Of course not. He's just a trumped up Nostradamus. So, so there you go. So I've got to be a trumped up Nostradamus for the next few minutes. Uh, as I say, the Guardian came back wanting more. They said they were really happy with the mail running with it, and they got 350,000 clicks to, on the story or something during the day. So there was all sorts of hostages to fortune in those in those uh, tips, including the next Conservative leader. So uh, <clears throat> who knows what the next political year will bring? I, I don't think it's going to be as dramatic. It could hardly be as dramatic. For, for those of us who are connoisseurs of political drama, we were probably spoilt. Uh, in, in in the last year, and I expect a, a quieter year uh, for, for lots of reasons. The fact that Boris Johnson has gone, the Conservatives know they can't really replace the leader again. It's not a credible position, given the election uh, is getting ever closer. So I'll, I'll sort of look first at, at one of the big problems that's in the one of the many problems that is in Rishi Sunak's in tray that he is trying to deal with at the moment, the protocol, and then look at uh, make a few predictions about the rest of the. Um, uh, what's going to go on. I mean, the protocol, we seem to have been dealing with this for so long, but the whole issue of Northern Ireland and Brexit, everyone knew it was going to be a problem from the outset. You know, I mean, within, a, within two months of the, um, of, of the Brexit vote, the European Commission asked me to do a report on the consequences for Northern Ireland of Brexit. So we seem to be wrestling with this now. It's seven, nearly seven years of wrestling with this. And we've had the episodic collapses of power sharing in Northern Ireland as well, and having to do appearances before the House of Commons Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, amongst others, trying to, you know, bring some sort of stability, because everyone knew, it didn't have to be Nostradamus, trumped up or otherwise, to see that the consequences for Northern Ireland of Brexit would be huge, and we're still seeing that played out now. So where are we up to? To cut a long story short, well, in terms of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, you know, if you look at uh, where we're at, well, first of all, the fact we've got a Northern Ireland protocol with a trade border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland is the exact reverse of what Boris Johnson had promised in 2018. I was there. I have to go to all the Northern Ireland political party conferences. Uh, you know, <laughs> this job is so glamorous. Um, I was there at the 2018 DUP conference. Boris Johnson was there. And he promised there would be no Irish sea border. There should be no, no conservative British prime minister could or should stand by an arrangement 
that divided Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And yet one year later, he did the deal uh, at that so-called World Summit with Leo Varadkar, the, the Taoiseach, uh, which basically signed up to uh, a Irish sea border. So the trade border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, what is it about? Well, it's subject to vary. It means that the EU has the right to check, in effect, any goods going between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, make sure they conform to EU standards. Basically, there's a, a customs alignment. Uh, EU rules on VAT pertain, EU rules on state aid to Northern Irish industry pertain, and the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, arbitrates. So Boris Johnson signed up to a deal diametrically opposed to what he promised Eunice, who perhaps understandably are enraged that he signed up to it, even though, of course, the DUP campaigned for Brexit, not thinking about the consequences of that Brexit for Northern Ireland. And it's been a depressing outworking of all this, to the point where the power sharing institutions in Northern Ireland, as we know, collapsed. They collapsed, you know, it's almost a year now since they went down. And of course they were down from 2017 to 2019. And part of the reason was Brexit. And now because of the protocol, the DUP uh, quit the institutions before last May's assembly elections. And the DUP did well in some respects. They lost first place in Northern Irish politics to Sinn Féin uh, earlier. Uh, in May last year, uh, but as the largest unionist party, they still have a veto over power sharing. If the DUP won't nominate, as they're refusing to do, a deputy first minister, Geoffrey Donaldson has not even left Westminster, he's never taken his seat at Stormont. If the DUP won't nominate, there's no power sharing. Even though, and this tends to be overlooked sometimes, the bulk, first of all, Northern Ireland voted against Brexit, 50, you know, there's a 56% vote to remain, and even though two thirds of voters in the May 2022 election, assembly election, voted for parties that were in favour of the protocol as a way of keeping the border on the island of Ireland soft and silent. The fact is, the largest unionist party, just as the largest nationalist party has, the largest unionist party has a veto on power sharing. So the big question is, can a deal be, be struck that will satisfy the DUP and restore power sharing in Northern Ireland? Well, I don't want to be gloomy tonight, and there are grounds for, for optimism uh, in terms of a restoration of power, share, of power sharing and sorting out a, a revised protocol. If we look at this, um, oops, oops, why am I more optimistic now that a deal will be done between the UK and the European Union on, on the protocol? Well, partly it's because you've got a new prime minister, and Rishi Sunak, if you... If you Look at the account of Brandon Lewis, a former, the former Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. He argues that the cabinet minister least enamoured with the Liz Trust bill, which attempts to simply disapply the protocol, which tries to pass legislation at Westminster, which simply says, we are not adhering to the protocol. We're not going to implement it. Rishi Sunak was the cabinet minister, when he was just a cabinet minister, least enamoured by that approach. He felt that it breached international law, and it's almost certainly correct. The fact is the UK and the EU signed uh, an, what is an international treaty, which involves the EU protocol. So you can't simply say, well, we're not going to implement it. We're just going to ignore international law. So Sunak didn't, doesn't like that approach. And so you've got much better move music now between the UK and the EU. Partly because Sunak recognises he doesn't want to jeopardise the overall trade deal, which may or be a bad one, that's a, a, another argument for another day. He doesn't want to jeopardise the UK's overall trade deal with the European Union. He doesn't want to annoy the Biden administration because the Biden administration, there's talk of Biden coming to Ireland to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement uh, come April this year. Uh, it would be an international embarrassment for the UK. You've got a set of collapsed political institutions associated with that agreement. The other grounds for optimism are that there was only last week the data sharing deal was concluded between the UK and the EU. Why does that matter? Well, it means that the, U the EU can now see all the trade data for firms trading between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And the EU can see which firms are trading only Great Britain to Northern Ireland and which firms are trading Great Britain, Northern Ireland and onwards south of the border into the Irish Republic, that is the EU single market. Now that the EU can see that, there is the scope to set up what have been termed green and red channels, in which the protocol becomes very, very light touch in terms of checks on goods going 
Great Britain to Northern Ireland only, i.e. from one part of the UK to another part of the UK, this side of the United Ireland, uh, if, it, if it ever happens. So um, that, in a sense, might be sellable to the DUP in the sense that they say, well, we've protected the UK internal market because it's GB to NI, GB to NI goods, very few checks. There's always been, it's a bit of a myth that there's never been checks on goods going Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Livestock, for example, has always been checked, which goes across at the Irish Sea. There's, there's always been checks on some goods. And really, you could keep checks to a minimum, but the protocol is not going to go away. And I think all but the most diehard units would, would probably accept that. The protocol will remain in place and there will still be extensive checks on goods going from Great Britain to Northern Ireland that are onward bound into the EU single market because the European Union is going to protect the integrity of its uh, single market. So that's the position where I, I do think the data sharing deal has opened the way forward now for a deal. And I do think there will be one uh, in the next few months. So that's optimistic. What, um, what else should we look out for in 2023 then? Uh, here, um, I tried to be optimistic, but, <laughs> but can't be really. Um, inflation will fall, but the falls are so slow, it's going to be, you know, we're looking at high single digit percentages, probably, you know, down, only down to about seven, eight percent by the end of 2023. So a drop in inflation, inflation peaked in October, uh, 11 and half percent. So it's good news of sorts, but it's, it's very limited. I think there will be some attempts to stimulate the economy. Uh, modest cuts in interest rates at the back end of the year. Um, the government has no room for fiscal manoeuvre at all, really. Um, if you look at the latest borrowing figures, they're horrific. 22 billion, a record was borrowed in October alone by the government. That's simply not sustainable. Then, and I don't need to tell this audience really, the NHS, I think the government is realising that pumping more money in, and every government has increased spending in real terms above inflation on the NHS, isn't working. And I think that some sort of royal commission is going to be set up on the NHS, because if you look at the, the figures for the NHS now, I mean, where to start? More than 7 million people on NHS waiting lists. The number of beds, despite that increase in spending, has been halved. The number of NHS beds has been halved over the last three decades. That's not a sustainable position at all. We spent three billion last year on agency payments because a lot of staff, you know, it's hard to fill vacancies in the NHS. So the use of agencies increases year on year, almost exponentially. Uh, three billion on agency payments to staff last year. Again, that's not sustainable. Uh, then there's the issue of social care and successive governments have run away from the Dilnot Commission which said, how are we going to pay for social care? One of the few things that initially Boris Johnson might have got right was this idea that you had a levy to pay for, for social care. But then there was, there's been a huge retreat uh, from that in terms of how we're going to fund social care. And I expect that debate to feature uh, throughout the year. If you look at the number of excess deaths you know, over the Christmas period, absolutely huge. It's a real crisis. In terms of the political weather for the government, they've got a major barrier in, in May with what I would predict would be the worst set of local election results the Conservatives will have had since 2010. The Conservatives have actually done quite well for a sitting government in local elections since they uh, came to office in 2010. Labour has often not been able to lay much of a glove uh, on the government, even in midterm. This looks a tricky set of elections because it's in Conservative Shire areas and the urban metropolitan areas, so the big set of local elections. If you look at the figures there on the slide, in the northwest alone, you've got loads. Um, so it's looking bleak. But however bleak things are, it shouldn't be as bad as this. This is how bad it got on one TV appearance that I made. They managed to mix it up uh, and predicted that we really would be in terrible, terrible difficulties uh, if what is in front of you uh, came to a uh, came to pass. So I'll stop the sharing there uh, and throw it, uh, uh, obviously, to, to uh, Emmy as the next speaker. Thanks very much.